Hello, good evening, and welcome to the Movie segment here on TV3. Tonight, we're shooting from the United States of America, and uh, I'm speaking to the first ever U.S. trade representative to Africa uh, in the administration of George W. Bush and Bill Clinton. She's a chief executive officer and the president of the We Take Our Group. I'm talking about Madam Rosa Whitaker. Thank you very much, Mom, for your time. Thank you. And good to have you. On Thank you. Tell us a bit about yourself, Rosa. Well, I like to start with that I'm a woman of faith, a follower of Christ, first and foremost. But I'm a woman who wears many hats. I am a wife. I am a mother. I'm first lady of a large ministry. And I'm a social entrepreneur who owns a business. Right. How long have you been in business? I've been in business. We're now in our 13th year. You started the We Take Our Group yes. in 2003? Yes. Is it? Yes. Mm. yes. And how much of a difficulty was that setting up the We Take Our Group? Well, I think it was, it certainly came with its challenges, but I think it was a very easy transition because it was an evolution of things that I had already done. I've been working now in Africa and on African issues for now about three decades. And so the Whitaker Group was pretty much an evolution. I had, um, I had worked as an uh, American diplomat on Africa. I had then, as you mentioned, been in government as the assistant U.S. trade representative for Africa. Uh, I had worked in community development. At 28, I was the director of the Office of International Business for the city of Washington, and I created some African initiatives there. And so it was kind of an evolution of continued work on Africa um, based on a commitment and a call that I've always had to advance enterprise solutions to address poverty. So it definitely came with its challenges, but the transition, I think, was easier for me. What informed the formation of the We Take Our Group? Well, I like to say it all starts with the call, a call that I always felt that I had in terms of call one to address poverty. And then I felt myself early on drawn to the cause um, and the opportunities in Africa. And so what formed the basis of the Whitaker Group is having worked on trade policy in the government, having been a part of a small group of hands-on architects of the African Growth and Opportunity Act. Have, yes, AGOA. Having served as a, as a diplomat in Africa, with the economic portfolio. So you begin to get a front seat eyewitness account of what's happening on the continent, what is working, what is not working. And, um, and you want to be a part of it in terms of change. And so as I was in government working on the policy framework to bring in American investments to Africa and to forge these trade ties, I then really began to realize that while we had the policy framework, there was a lot of work to be done in getting the companies and the investments actually into Africa. And the Whitaker Group was established with precisely that purpose. We wanted to help to facilitate and navigate businesses. We wanted to, and we have, sell the opportunities, um, uh, promote the opportunities to the global business community that are in Africa, and bring business into Africa in ways that are impactful on poverty, very people-centered, very innovative. Is Africa still that attractive? I think Africa is very attractive, and I know there's been a debate about is it really rising or is this rhetoric? I don't think it's rhetoric at all. I think we can clearly see the growth. We clearly see the progress. Um, I really think that Africa, as, and I know we're not talking about Africa as one country, but overall, if I had to generalize, I think Africa is getting a bad deal in terms of branding. Because the Africa that I experience, and I spend a lot of time on the ground, um, is not the Africa that I see um, displayed on the news or in the boardrooms or when I'm coming to present to investors. 
So despite all that we're doing, there's a challenge with branding of Africa. There's a challenge with branding of Africa. There's an information gap. Some say that Africa is a data desert. So a lot of the information that an investor or people would um, depend on, a lot of data to form opinions, they can't find um, in Africa readily accessible. I'm still waiting for um, the kind of Africa version of Al Jazeera. Um, and with technology, Africa could brand itself. Quite apart from the rebranding of Africa, there are clear challenges with regards to macroeconomic uh, conditions mm -hmm. in many African countries. I mm -hmm. mean, look at Ghana, for instance. Uh, over the years, there's been macroeconomic challenges. Investors look at that before yes, they come into the country. Definitely. Okay? Well, if that's very true. You have to have something real valuable to brand before you can talk about branding in a vacuum. Overall, if you look at the growth rates, they're up. I mean, they're rebounding, they dip, they're rebounding. I think that if you look at regional integration, particularly in East Africa, you know, African countries in East Africa are trading more among each other than they have in the past. But I think it's a question of pace and it's a question of policy choices. And this is where we have to continue to um, make a lot of progress. Um, I look at the indebtedness of a lot of African countries, and when I see, and I, I read somewhere credibly, <laughs> that they're like $3.5 trillion in subsoil in sub assets. And so um, the indebtedness and even the fact that African countries are still dependent on aid. Corruption. Um, and you're on record to have said that over the past 50 years, uh, the United States has sent close to about $330 billion in terms of aid to Africa, but just about 40% is actually being tapped on the ground. Well, um, we have sent a lot of aid, um, and um, I am very critical of aid. I believe in smart aid, but I think globally from the donor community that a lot of the aid is not smart, and I don't believe that a lot of the aid is hitting the ground. And I think we need to look at that and we need to look at why. Um, corruption on the ground uh, could be an issue, but we also see in the West an aid industrial complex where you have these plethora of NGOs absorbing a lot of the aid money and overhead cost. And so what I've asked for is I really think that the taxpayers American taxpayers, European taxpayers, the backers of, of aid, the taxpayers ought to know how much aid is actually hitting the ground. Um, and I, um, and I, I think that we would be very disappointed in that number. And how are they going to be identify that? Oh, I think that, you know, just as NGOs come out and they evaluate governments, they evaluate democracies, and they have these monitoring systems, they need to be monitored. Um, and we need a reform of aid. Now, and I'm not saying that all aid is bad. Is it wrong for Ghana to seek an, a bailout from the International Monetary Fund, for instance? Well, you know, I don't know enough about that because I believe that when you look at bailouts, when you look at debts, when you look at these kind of agreements, the devil is in the details. And so um, I don't have access to the details. But I will say generally, I think that, and I spend a lot of time in, I live part-time in Ghana, generally in Ghana, I think you have all the assets to do, to continue uh, building and do very well. And um, you, in the future, I am confident with the right policy choices, um, you will not have to depend on aid or debt to sustain your growth. Let's talk a bit about yourself and the We Take Her group. Uh, how much of employment have you created over the past uh, 10 or so years? Well, the Whitaker Group, we work in consortiums, and we work for large corporations um, that have that share our vision about people-centered um, um, policies and people-centered investment and trade. So we basically, I, I don't, I wouldn't want us to take credit for any employment, but I can say we've been a part of a process and part of initiatives that have created hundreds of thousands of jobs across the continent. And how much of uh, investments have you made so far? 
Well, so what we've been a part of, uh, I say our clients have made investments. Um, I think with confidence, I would say that we have helped to facilitate. We've long years ago, we passed the billion dollar mark and the $2 billion mark. So it's in the billions of dollars. Now that's not investments we've made ourselves. I, we are a small firm. We're not, um, you know, billionaire investors. But as in terms of the initiatives that we've created and the partnerships that we've established and the investors that we have brought in, um, I think that would um, fairly describe our impact on the ground across the continent. If I asked you what your biggest uh, impact has been, what would you say? Um, I think in terms of professional impact, I still have to go back to AGOA, the African Growth and Opportunity Act. And I go back to AGOA because of the market opening um, nature of AGOA. Even, I think, in 2015, $19 billion in African products came to the U.S. duty and quota free. You're talking about initiatives that started we started the drafting process, 95 and 96. It took four or five years to pass. Um, and I think anything meaningful requires um, some effort. Um, and then it passed, at one point, we were up to $45 billion in African products going into the United States duty-free. Those products are even, um, the exports from Africa are now more diversified. That is a measurable, tangible impact. Um, it is estimated that between 1.3, about 1.3 million jobs directly and indirectly have been established as a result of AGOA. There's been a lot of criticism, you know, that African countries have not really mm -hmm. uh, taken that much advantage, you know, of the uh, Growth and Opportunity Act. Uh, you look at the, the sort of demands that's coming from the U.S. market and uh, they're not really able mm -hmm. to meet those demands. Yeah. What do we have to do differently? Well, I think that AGOA and market access is just one part of the puzzle. It's just one piece of the puzzle. You still have to have the capacity to produce the kind of products that the world wants. And with that, I think that's where the policy choices comes in. That's where the for education the and training uh, for the companies. Eligible countries. Yeah, and the, and, the, and the policy choices have to do with support for the private sector, support for standards, um, su um, support for education, um, making sure that um, governments are supporting private companies, even in meeting the sanitary and phytosanitary market requirements of Europe and the United States. So if we're really talking about transitioning African countries from poverty to prosperity, we really need a very multifaceted approach. And we can look at what some of the other countries have done, you know, that have grown. Um, investments in education, people-centered policies, a focus on a private sector, local and international. Is Sub-Saharan Africa still an attractive investment destination? I mean, there's a lot of talk about the issue of power, for instance. Mm -hmm. uh, Ghana, my country, has suffered uh, a power crisis for the past three years now, and that's not positive for uh, industry growth and setup. Mm -hmm. Is it still attractive for a lot of investors? I think that it would be more attractive um, with the power crisis solved, and that's why if you look in Ghana and you look across the continent, governments have made power a priority and you see the progress. And so the power contributes to the, the, uh, the high cost of power and the lack of power contributes to the highest cost of doing business in Africa. So there are a lot of investors that will not come in um, just because of the power crisis. And certainly I think that the continent would be in a position to attract more manufacturing investments um, if they could address the power crisis. I see, you know, it's, it's their variances across the continent. Some countries are really aggressively addressing the power crisis. Uganda is aggressively addressing the power crisis. And it will probably, Uganda, Ethiopia, they will, are on the path to becoming net exporters of power. Um, and so it is, it is possible, and you have rightly pinpointed one of the greatest impediments to attracting investors where we need it most and where we need it most across the continent is in the manufacturing sector because that is going to be the engine of, of growth and the engine for job creation. In, in November, we're going into an election. How much does political stability mean to investors? 
Well, it means almost everything to most investors. I think that, in my view, political instability, when it happens, it can sit you back decades. I mean, we have Liberia, um, for instance. Um, that civil war in Liberia interrupted a lot of progress. Um, fortunately, Liberia has a phenomenal president now and leadership team, and they're accelerating. But I wonder, what would have happened if that civil war had not happened with the kind of leadership? So inst when, instead of catching up and making up, they could actually be building on a stronger foundation. There are a lot of young ladies out there who look up to you. They've read your story. They, they, they're touched by the enormous contribution you're making to, to Africa in terms of trade and investments, the job creation opportunities and all that. What do they need to do? Well, I always say um, they should work to be their, their best selves. Um, and this is where, this is an issue that touches deeply on my faith because I hear this a lot from young ladies and young ladies in, in my church that I'm mentoring. And I always tell them, I fundamentally believe that um, we were all put here for a reason. God gave us an assignment, and we all have that assignment. Be on a journey to figure out that assignment. What is the reason for which you were brought here? Um, you know, wisdom teacher Mike Murdoch always says you will know, be known for one or two things, the problems you create or the problems you solve. What problems? were you brought here to solve? What new discoveries were you given life to make? Um, and I also believe, and I used to say, follow your passion, follow your passion. But I must admit, I, I hear that a lot, and I don't really believe that anymore. No, because I, I hear everybody saying, just follow your passion, do what you love. I think it's deeper than that. Um, it's, it's not about your passion, it's about his purpose. Because it's, if, and if your passion is aligned with God's purpose for your life, then it works. Rosa, it's been such a joy speaking to you on the Mover segment. I'm delighted to have you. I am delighted and very proud of you as well. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Thank you. So that's how we wrap up on our Mover segments here on TV3. Uh, my guest has been Rosa Whitaker. Thank you very much for watching.